Good morning. I'm Sergeant Robert Horton, United States Army Special Operations. I was a Psychological Operations Specialist from 1999 to 2012, and I'm also a son of the American Revolution. Now everyone is wondering about this Russell J. Gould and David Wynn Miller story. And everybody wants to know what in the world is going on with that. What does it mean, right? Okay, but to understand what it means, you have to understand what's going on on planet Earth that you all need to be made aware of so you can understand what it is these guys are talking about, okay? So I'm going to go back to the beginning. This is a very old Masonic system that's operating here on planet Earth. And it is all based upon shipping and postal wars that have morphed into banking wars. Okay, so the three really work together hand in hand, but the banking warfare has really kicked off here as of late in relation to this whole thing. So when you're born here on this planet, or here on this planet, you are born of the water, right? Because this is a shipping war. You're all captured in a shipping warfare that you're unaware of that you've been captured into. So when you're born, you're born of your mother's water. And you are docked as a vessel by a doctor who is a registered harbor master by the port authorities and authorized by the Department of Transportation. And when you are docked by the doctor, you are then harbored in the harbor in a vessel in dry dock known as a hospital, which is considered to be a boat parked on the land. Okay, but when you're born and harbored by the harbor master in this vessel in dry dock, you are considered a ward of the state. So you are placed into a maternity ward. Why are you a ward of the state? Because you have not yet been brought under the laws of this old school Masonic system. Now how they get you into this old school Masonic system is with the birth certificate. So you're considered a ward of the state or an outlaw because you're not yet under the laws of the old Masonic system until your mother signs a birth certificate. This is a commercial instrument, okay? This is saying that you are now owned and under the laws of this Masonic system, but you are owned and that you are nothing more than a piece of cargo or a vessel or a dead person that's presumed to be missing, dead or lost at sea, right? Once you're legged into this massive corporate construct and it's a global construct, you are then subject to the laws of the state state of affairs not state of california or state of nevada we're talking global state of affairs you're legged into the state it's in favor of the banks it's certainly not in favor of the people what happens when you have a child is your child is given a social security number they estimate how many taxes your child is going to pay over his or her lifetime and they went they take that birth certificate and they issue it on the capital markets and they earn money on it. Once that happens, you are then under the laws of this entire global construct. I'm saying something much worse, actually. What I'm saying is that when every citizen goes into the court system, they are not seen there as themselves a U.S. citizen. They're seen as the person who had their birth certificate pledged. You're there as a debtor. You're not there as a citizen. We have been converted from human beings that are citizens of the Republic of the United States into chattel. Chattel, that is a legal term for something which is property. We are now considered to be property of the Federal Reserve. We're not considered to be human beings and citizens of the United States. These are the pillars of the laws of this global construct. Admiralty and Maritime and Civil Jurisdiction. Law of the Sea, Law of the Land. Law of the Sea has always been held by the King of Great Britain. Okay, that's how he runs his entire country. It's considered a vessel, a great big boat, and all the people in that boat are considered to be missing, dead, or presumed lost at sea with their birth certificate system. That's how he runs his whole country. And that's the same thing we're doing here in the United States. Why? Because Great Britain has always been our postmaster general here in the colonies and the 50 states. Now let me explain what postmaster general of the world is. Okay, this is our vessel. This is planet Earth. 
this is the vessel that we're all floating around on in this sea of space we call the solar system or the galaxy. This is our outpost, right? Our boat. The postmaster general or the general of the post is Great Britain. Always has been. This is an old school Masonic warfare platform, planetary warfare platform based upon shipping, postal, and banking wars. Okay, I've explained the shipping to you. The postal revolves around timelines. When you're brought into a jail, the timelines kick off, whether it's a federal offense, state offense, or local offense. Different uh, venues have different timelines, okay, and there's several. His whole system is enforced in the courts around the world. This whole system is enforced in the courts, and what they're enforcing is the elemental chart, his uh, strategic metals contract, his styles manual, and the dictionary, which is basically the entire system all of us are using, the grammatical construct we all use. All of these contracts and this entire system is enforced in the courts around the world. Those are called the neutral ports. That's where the wars are fought in relation to this entire matter, right? If you got a grievance, you go into the courts or the neutral ports and you fight it out. But this thing is set up to make sure that he always wins, okay? This entire system is set up so that you never win. All they look at you as is a piece of cargo, a boat or a vessel that can be harvested, raped, plundered, and pillaged for its goods. So this is the old school Masonic system that these guys have set up and this is what is being defended on planet Earth, okay? This whole system belongs to the King of Great Britain or is run and defended by the King of Great Britain. Okay, so he is the postmaster general of the world. All of the countries on planet Earth are utilizing and playing with this system, okay? Doesn't matter if you're in Russia, China, or Germany. If you get married here in the United States, you're still considered to be married in Russia, China, or Germany. If you get divorced, you're considered divorced all over the world, right? Because the courts are all connected. Everybody's playing this game. It's a, it's a big, old school Masonic system that they utilize to control the people and run the planet with. This is the old school monarchical system that commands and controls the entire planet, or at least is attempting to. All of the countries on planet Earth are utilizing this Masonic warfare platform, okay? And as they are all high ranking Masons, all of them, okay? Not, not Masons in the, ter or in the form of uh, guys who are setting up sidewalks and driveways, okay? They're not those type of Masons. These Masons build governments. They build them and they defend them. The contracts that I pointed out that, that the King of Great Britain has, all the countries have those same contracts. They all, all have their own uh, strategic metals contract in place that allows them to print and mint their own coinage based upon their banking system, okay? Everybody has commodities that they trade around the world with each other and that's what those banking systems are based upon. Oil being one of the biggest. And the King of Great Britain is the reigning monarch on the planet. That's why he is the postmaster general of the world. What we're going to look at is where the crown derives its authorizations or its authorities that their entire system is based upon. Okay, real quick, let's go back and, and recover some American history, okay? Back when the colonies were founded, uh, there was 13 colonies originally. And before the American Revolution broke out, our post office was the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania post office, the Benjamin Franklin post office, okay, or postal court, which is here. And once the American Revolution had broke out, the, the king had cut off our ability to conduct international trade and commerce out of that post office because we went to war against Great Britain, right? So the war, all wars vacate that kind of contract. So our shipping was cut off. 
after the American Revolution, uh, we couldn't open commerce back up through this post office because we owed 1.6 million francs to the French for funding the American Revolution. So at that point, the King of Spain and the King of France argued over who was going to be the postmaster general here in the United States to open it up to international trade and commerce. Right? Spain said that they had found America first, Christopher Columbus had discovered the New World first, and so they had rights to it. France said that without loaning America the 1.6 million francs, the United States wouldn't even be open for capture. But the King of Great Britain, still being the reigning monarch in the world, said those are my people, and I'm going to put my post office in up there and open this thing up to trade and commerce. You guys need to stand down. So that's how he became the Postmaster General of the United States. And the Canada location has always been attached to that postal location as well. So the King of Great Britain took tactical command and control of the entire North American continent in the process. So if the other reigning monarchs and dictators of the world wanted to come into our country or the United States and rape and pillage it for its natural resources and its goods, they'd have to go through him and his post office to do so. So everything that was shipped in and out of the country, all trade and commerce, he got a piece up through that post office. Just like he did down in the East Indies. He is taking tactical command and control of the movement and shipment of all goods on planet Earth. That's his end goal. Okay, now there was a long range objective that had been placed into motion here by the Crown, the Vatican, and London City and the Rothschilds. Okay. And the reason the American Revolution had kicked off was because the United States wanted to float its currency into the global market. And because they based their, their monetary system on the value of the land, it never fluctuates. It's, it's, a, it's a solid base, right? But the Rothschilds fluctuate gold and silver up and down in relation to what they have going on. And because our currency doesn't fluctuate, when these guys would drop the price of gold down, America could buy it up and eventually would become the global power on the planet. So the Rothschilds attacked the crown and the crown said, you guys can't do that. And as a matter of fact, this is war against me and I'm not going to let that happen. So that's what, that was the reason for the American Revolution. But the long range objective was to get the United States to borrow money from these guys in an effort to surrender them back to Great Britain. And how that was going to work was you only get three chances to pay off the debt that you borrow from these guys. And if you can't pay it off, then your surrender, the crown will step in, pay the debt to these guys off for you, and then capture you back as part of his system or part of Great Britain. And you'd all become peasants and serfs again. And this entire thing revolved around the year 1999. This is an event horizon year, not just for the United States, but for the entire planet. Okay, so when the colonies had come out of the American Revolution and the king stepped in as postmaster general for the United States, the U.S. Constitution was drafted, okay? And the U.S. Constitution outlined how this, how the king's government was going to interact with the colonies in relation to international trade and commerce. Okay, and, and this thing was seen by Patrick Henry and the colonials as so tyrannical that they created the Bill of Rights, outlining or I should say, laying out what it was that the King of Great Britain and that federal, that federal government, the Fed, would never have the power to infringe upon because they knew that this king was so tyrannical, eventually he would enforce his authority into the state's territories and try to tell you what you could and couldn't say, what you could and couldn't write, right? The freedom of the press, that you couldn't bear arms, you wouldn't have the right to defend your country. So those things were all outlined here in the Bill of Rights, and those are the things the king would never have the power to infringe upon, ever. It was done. It was the only thing that ratified the U.S. Constitution. And they were not going to sign it. The colonials refused to sign it until these guys, the Fed, accepted this outline. The reason that 1999 is an event horizon year is because in 1999, 1999 was the end of the third and final international bankruptcy for the United States. And we were going to be surrendered back over to Great Britain because we couldn't afford to pay the debt to London and the Rothschilds and the 13 banking families, families off. But that meant that the U.S. Constitution had come to an end. It was over. It was the end of the third and final international bankruptcy and the contract between us and Great Britain expired. 
incorporated the United States as a company. And they made the president of the United States the chief executive officer. And they made the representatives of Congress managers. And so when people come to Congress, they're, they're taught very quickly that their constituents are not what it's all about. What it's all about is for them to get on the dole of the, the federal government, which is there to um, enslave the people who live in the United States. That's what that is. So what does that mean the U.S. Constitution had come to an end? Well, it was the end of the third and final international bankruptcy for the United States. And with the end of the third and final international bankruptcy, the King of Great Britain had to vacate the position as Postmaster General due to international banking law. And the trustee between us and Great Britain or the bankruptcy has always been the President of the United States. Well, if there's no more bankruptcy, then there's no more need for a trustee. The agreement with us and Great Britain is over. So, no bankruptcy, no trustee. So in 1999, there should not have been a presidential election held. The U.S. Congress should have been shut down, the Senate should have been shut down, everybody should have been fired, and we should have held a new constitutional convention and resubstantiated the entire government from the ground up, and they never told the American people about any of it. Now, with the end of the American Revolution, the United States didn't have a strategic metals contract in place, okay? We weren't allowed to print and mint our own coinage, so we had to borrow it from these guys, from the Rothschilds and London City authorized by the Crown because the Crown has a, a strategic metals contract in place and that's what we've been utilizing. In 1933, with the Great Depression, actually 1929 is when the uh, beginning of the third and final international bankruptcy uh, had started or the end of the second had come to an end. Uh, we were, because we were borrowing money from these guys over here, uh, we're now in usury with this system, okay? So that is how we're captured in usury with these guys over here. We're using their money. We're not allowed to make or create our own. And as a matter of fact, we're borrowing it and paying it back with interest in hard natural assets. Okay, all of this is going somewhere, okay? This is all going back to David Wynn Miller and Russell J. Gould and what they have done uh, to the planet that everybody needs to be, be made aware of. But before we get into that, you have to understand what it was they ran headlong into that they had no idea was going on on the planet, okay? That pretty much stopped what they were doing right in its tracks and vice versa. Okay, so this is where the banking warfare and the warfare against the United States really kicks off. Back in 1933, Roosevelt was in office and a Nazi coup inspired and led by Gerald Maguire, backed by Prescott Bush, J.P. Morgan, Remington, and Goodyear were trying to get Roosevelt out of office. And what they did was they tried to elicit the help of General Smedley Butler of the United States Marine Corps. Uh, in an effort to help them get Roosevelt out of office. They figured that with Butler's influence over the American soldiers that he could assemble 500,000 men and help them get Roosevelt out. Let me warn you and let me warn the nation against the smooth evasion that says, of course we believe these things. We believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving homes. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all these things. But we do not like the way the present administration is doing them. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything. 
Thanks, thank God for Smedley Butler. He blew the whistle and their plan failed. However, these corporate heads, JP Morgan, Remington, Goodyear, and the others were never indicted for this treasonous act. And so it continued on in the shadows. From there, it's been one long range orchestrated event to get these guys into the White House. A few years later, Eisenhower comes into office. And under his watch, the CIA gets set up. And Eisenhower then gave a masterful speech on a conspiracy that he was worried about. And he told the American people, keep an eye on the military industrial complex because he saw it as extremely dangerous. Throughout America's adventure in free government, our basic purposes have been to keep the peace, to foster progress in human achievement, and to enhance liberty, dignity, and integrity among peoples and among nations. To strive for less would be unworthy of a free and religious people. Progress toward these noble goals is persistently threatened by the conflict now engulfing the world. It commands our whole attention, absorbs our very beings. We face a hostile ideology, global in scope, atheistic in character, ruthless in purpose, and insidious in method. Unhappily, the danger it poses promises to be of indefinite duration. Under Eisenhower's watch, the Five Star Trust was set up by the CIA. The Five Star Trust consisted of five top men, those being George Bush Sr., Richard Armitage, General Edward Lansdale, William Colby, and General Robert L. Ferreira. Those were the five guys that ran the Five Star Trust for the CIA. Now what the Five Star Trust was, Their objective was to set up the largest drug and money laundering system the world had ever seen. And it was called Operation Studebaker and Operation Clean Room, which was the money laundering system's end of the operation. And that was ran out of Kentucky by Marion Horn. A gentleman named Marion Horn. The main objective of this operation was to create money for the CIA uh, so they wouldn't have to go and ask Congress for money. Uh, doing so might divulge plans the CIA had going on. So they developed the largest drug and money laundering system the world has ever seen. The objective of which was to set up a drug running operation and then put all the money into a conglomeration of banks set up by the Rothschilds and the 13 banking families known as the Five Star Trust. That is Lucifer's Sustainable Development Fund. Okay, that's Lucifer's piggy bank. I'm just going to say it. So, once this all got set up, Kennedy came into office. And Kennedy warned us of a massive conspiracy that scared him so bad, he created U.S. Special Forces. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret society, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. 
and he began working for the people to try to get the Federal Reserve out of here and get us back on a silver standard. And that is, we can have honest, solid currency, like what President Kennedy was doing 10 days before he was assassinated. Unfortunately, John F. Kennedy was murdered for his efforts. Eventually, George Bush Sr. becomes head of the CIA. And Kennedy, I'm sorry, and Reagan takes office. And sees this whole thing going on and warns the American people about it. He made several speeches warning the American people about the same thing Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy did. Now let's set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war, but there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace, and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this, but every lesson of history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement, and this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement, and it gives no choice between peace and war only between fight or surrender. If we continue to accommodate, continue to back and retreat, eventually we have to face the final demand, the ultimatum. And what then? When Nikita Khrushchev has told his people, he knows what our answer will be. He has told them that we're retreating under the pressure of the Cold War, and someday, when the time comes to deliver the final ultimatum, our surrender will be voluntary because by that time, we will have been weakened from within spiritually, morally, and economically. He believes this because from our side he's heard voices pleading for peace at any price, or better read than death, or as one commentator put it, he'd rather live on his knees than die on his feet. And therein lies the road to war, because those voices don't speak for the rest of us. You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? Just in the face of this enemy? Or should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery under the pharaohs? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots at Concord Bridge have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard round the world? The martyrs of history were not fools. And our honored dead, who gave their lives to stop the advance of the Nazis, didn't die in vain. Where then is the road to peace? Well, it's a simple answer after all. You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. Winston Churchill said the destiny of man is not measured by material complications. When great forces around the moon in the world, we learn their spirits, not animals. He said there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, which, whether we like it or not, spells doom. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. He was talking about Christianity and how if we ever became an atheistic country or a socialistic dictatorship under an atheistic regime, the United States would go down. So he tried to do everything in his power he could to stop what was going on. And George Bush Sr. tried five times to assassinate Kennedy. That's all been declassified. Sometime after that, George Bush Sr. becomes President of the United States. Now, this was a long-range warfare objective to get here, and they finally got there. Once this drug and money laundering system was all set up, they were going to then empower the United Nations to institute a global tax on everyone. At this particular juncture, by then, there is 230 million, 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 quadrillion dollars in the Sustainable Development Fund that these guys are using, using as a black ops shadow government bank account. If they install a global tax on everyone in the world, how much bigger is this bank account going to get? 
At this point, the CIA was just going to be used to continue to go in and soften other countries up in a new world order effort that was being launched out of the White House. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. The long-range objective. Now, this was all heading for the event horizon year of 1999. That's where this is all going. This is an event horizon year for the country and for the globe. Because once George Bush Sr. got in to be President of the United States, he saw the end of the third and final international bankruptcy coming, and he knew that the U.S. Constitution would dissolve, and the agreement between us and Great Britain would be dissolved at that point or voided and gone. The U.S. Constitution was going to be gone. So he went back to the Crown, told his cousins what was going on, and they knighted him. The plan was to resubstantiate the U.S. Constitution so the King could still continue to uh, oversee the international affairs in relation to shipping and commerce of the United States and the New World Order would be launched out of Washington, D.C. And like I said, a global tax would be instituted by the United Nations and their plans would be fulfilled. But before they can do that, they have to bring all the banks in under one banking system, under the Rothschilds banking system. So the next objective, the Middle East. They got to go into the Middle East and get the oil. Why? Because there's only nine banks left in the world that are not ran by the Rothschilds, seven of which are in the Middle East. So if they go in and steal the oil, then the banks have nothing to create a banking system off of. They collapse and then they got to borrow money from here. The warfare is real simple. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz, I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision. We're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> He said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. The truth is about the Middle East is, had there been no oil there, it would be like Africa. Nobody is threatening to intervene in Africa. The problem is the opposite. We keep asking for people to intervene and stop it. And there's, uh, there's no question that the presence of petroleum throughout the region has sparked great power involvement. Whether that was the specific motivation for the coup or not, I can't tell you. But but there was definitely, there's always been this attitude that somehow we could intervene and use force in the region. After that, they got to go after Chavez in Venezuela. That's the last vestige. Then their plans really will be complete. However, in 1999, their plans were foiled. Like I said, this was an event horizon year. They weren't the only ones that saw this thing coming to an end. A simple review at the high school level, high school education, uh, clearly details 
the fact that Great Britain and the Vatican had gotten together and had decided that the United States would never come to allow a one world global dictator to rule their country. And everybody knows that the Vatican has always had an agreement with the Nazis. Not so much Germany itself, but the Nazi party up there in Germany, operating out of Germany. They tried to set up a one world global dictatorship under Hitler a long time ago. We are talking about the biggest thuggery of all and that is the Jesuits in the Vatican. Um, I always thought that the CIA was the problem and the, you know, the other intelligence agencies. Guess what? There's a grand intelligence agency that the Vatican puts out, and all of those other crooks are operating under the Vatican intelligence agency. This was a long-range effort by these guys to come up from the rear and accomplish this objective. Now the plan of the CIA with the setup of the Five Star Trust was that the five top gentlemen, or I should say men, that were going to run the, the Five Star Trust for the CIA were going to take turns being the director of the CIA. So those five guys could stay in command and control of this entire operation. The objective is to set up a one world global, global dictatorship with Lucifer at the top running the United Nations. And this is the piggy bank they're going to utilize to achieve that objective. But thank goodness, in 1999, as I said, this all revolved around the International Bankruptcy of the United States, which, thank goodness, left the Washington, D.C. postal location open for capture on November 2nd, 1999, for 18 days. There was an 18-day period in there that the crown was going to have to vacate the position and the post office would be open and the United States would no longer have the ability to conduct international trade and commerce, hence the Florida Chads. That's because in 1999 the U.S. Constitution had come to an end and was closed out with the end of the third and final international bankruptcy. With that, they had the Amero set, the American European dollar, and they were about to surrender the United States back over to Great Britain. However, in 1999, during that 18-day vacancy, a miracle had taken place. Now, anyone who's listened to Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Reagan make their speeches will know that these gentlemen have been warning us of a group of people on this planet who are literally conspiring together in an effort to try to get the United States military to go to war for them in an effort to set this one world global government up. Okay, and that's what they were warning us about. They said, we're a nation of peace. We have to remain and stay a nation of peace. There's a group of people out there who are trying to get us to surrender everything over to them so that they can utilize our military to go and achieve their world objectives and that they were going to utilize or create some fanciful event that would allow them then to do that. And that's what we had with the Twin Towers event and the 9-11 episode. So they actually got what they finally wanted. That was an orchestrated event. Uh, it was, there was never any terrorists and terrorism itself is a fraud. You cannot have a war where there is no enemy. You don't have an enemy. Show me the enemy. There is no enemy. The enemies are, or the enemy is, anyone who does not go along with their new world order effort. That's who they're targeting, and that's who their terrorists are. This is a very simple warfare effort to follow. This entire soap opera is very easy to follow. The next thing they want are your guns and they're going to come hard for them. They're going to come hard for guns here in America. That is the one thing that is stopping them from taking absolute total tactical command and control of this nation. And if they ever come for your guns, that is when you will have surrendered everything. They've already attacked your freedom of your right to choose, your freedom of speech, your freedom of the press, and now they're on this onto the Second Amendment. They are coming for our guns, but they will not get them. 
anyone signing on to that kind of legislation, Nancy Pelosi being number one, wants to surrender your borders, take your weapons, force you to buy health care. These are your new world order extremists, okay? These guys are all working for Lucifer. They want a one world global dictator at the top. Who is it? It's Lucifer. We all know it. Biblical prophecy. Now, prior to 1999, there were two gentlemen who were working to get themselves out of the Masonic global government system that we've all been enslaved to through the birth certificate system. Those two men were Russell J. Gould and David Wynn Miller, or Russell hyphen J. Colin Gould and David hyphen Wynn Colin Miller. David hyphen Wynn Colin Miller was the one who broke the mathematical interface on math and grammar. And here's the equation for that. Anybody that's been out there and studying this, I'm not going to go too far into. Russell J. Gould was the individual who then imparted the now time aspect into this grammatical construct, thereby giving it its own jurisdiction. So at this point, they knew that they had a whole new system of grammar that the world had never seen, that now being set up the way it was needed to be utilized to create an entirely new government system off of. So they had to go all the way back to where the crown derives its authorities. They went back all the way back into the Masonic books, and we'll just throw one out there, the secret teachings of Manly Hall, Manly P. Hall secret teaching of teachings of all ages. They went back and they syntaxed this book and then rewrote it in this quantum construct, in this now time grammatical quantum construct. And they did that with all of the books, all of the Masonic books that are utilized to substantiate the Crown's authorizations here in the world. Thereby giving their system its own venue. They've created an entirely new federal government system for the entire world to now join with. And it is a global federal government system and it is based in truth. The entire system is based on mathematically certifiable grammar. It has its own elemental chart and periodic tables that one unwinds, creates a mathematical fact forward and backward in both directions. When this, when this elemental chart and periodic table unwinds itself, it creates affinity loop or a figure eight, thereby validating itself forward and backwards just like the grammatical construct does. This thing was genius. Knowing what these men had at their fingertips, all they needed was the right time and place in history to launch this thing and take the greatest leap of faith ever taken by any two gentlemen ever recorded in the history of this planet. Once this thing was all set up, the books that they had syntax, they had filed with the Vatican and the NSA and several other locations on planet Earth. Uh, and the Vatican had been studying it for five years prior to what eventually took place in 1999. Russell J. Gould, with the help of David Wynn Miller, in 1999 saw the end of the third and final international bankruptcy coming. And Russell, knowing was about what was about to take place here, ran down to the United Nations and asked the United Nations if they had a copyright and patent on the Title IV flag. Knowing that it didn't matter if they did or they didn't, the contract would have been found to have been in grammatical fraud and grammatical error. So he rewrote the copyright and patent for the Title IV flag for the United States because it was about to be surrendered back over to Great Britain along with the country at the end of the third and final international bankruptcy. So he takes off up to the United Nations with the Title IV flag in tow and legs this whole government system in. And there at the United Nations, he was declared a sovereign. In the process, he had just taken down the entire old monarch system. Because once they reestablished those Masonic books, they had to resubstantiate all of them in a quantum grammar construct, thereby disqualifying the old system completely from the bloodlines on. And in that effort, have set this entire global government system up for the world. 
Russ then turns back around and during that 18 day vacancy that that post office was open, the king had to vacate due to international banking law for 18 days. Russell legs back in down here at the post office in Washington DC taking tactical command and control of the United States and Canada because that post office has always been attached to the DC location. And in doing so, he just brought to an end the New World Order effort to surrender the United States back over to the Crown, utilize the United Nations to install a global tax because no one has a charter to exist anymore as a corporation under his authority. Everything has been disqualified. It's over. So prior to 1999, Russell J. Gould, I'm sorry, Russell hyphen J. Colin Gould had rewritten a new U.S. Constitution, a Bill of Rights, a Declaration of Independence, he had resubstantiated the charter for all of the federal municipalities. He had captured the flag for the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and the Coast Guard, and resubstantiated the entire construct in a quantum global effort or quantum global manner. Thereby, in 1999, when he moved into the Washington, D.C. postal location, taking tactical command and control of the United States and the rest of the North American continent, the New World Order and the Crown didn't have authorization to send our military to war for them after 9-11 had occurred because they didn't have the authorization to do so. They had been disqualified. It was over. But you got to remember, this was an act of patriotism on his part. This is a patriot for the country. This guy is from Wyoming. Okay? This guy's a patriot to the country. He saw the end of the third and final international bankruptcy coming. He knew we were about to be surrendered back over to Great Britain along with the flag and it would hang like this in a surrendered manner. And he did his duty as a patriot. He stepped in where he needed to step in and he saved the country and the flag from being surrendered. And he's still holding on to that Title IV flag for the people of this country and safeguarding it for the people of this country. Now even more astounding was that prior to 1999 and him taking tactical command and control of Washington DC, he had built a brand new banking system. That's what this is. That is the banking system he put together. And at the same time as he legged into Washington DC taking tactical command and control of the entire country, he legged this banking system in at the US Treasury Department. So now we can get rid of the Fed. The Fed can go bye-bye. Shouldn't have been here since 1999. They, once the charter expired and the bankruptcy had come to an end, the Federal Reserve should have, it did not have the authorization at that point to continue to print money for the United States. And the IRS should, was actually kicked out of the country because that was the collection agency for the debt. Well, if there's no more debt, there's no more need for an IRS. As a sovereign, he has a strategic metals contract that is based upon his elemental chart and his periodic table, giving him the authorization to print and mint his own coinage. This is the first time in the history of the country that this country actually has the power to print and mint its own coinage. We do not have to use the strategic metals contract of the old monarch. It's over. This was an act of patriotism. This was all due to the circumstances that revolved around the third and final international bankruptcy of this country coming to an end. And thank God we were saved. So after legging back in as Postmaster General here for the United States, um, he then proceeded to go around the world and reauthorize everything under his authority that would authorize or substantiate this system in its totality. So he had to go all the way back to the International Maritime Admiralty and Maritime Organization and reauthorize it under the Quantum Authority. He had to go back to the Universal Postal Union in Bern, Switzerland and reauthorize it under his authority. He had to go back to the uh, International uh, Bureau of Weights and Measures 
and reauthorize it under his authority because he had just destroyed all banking and chemistry on planet Earth with this LML chart and this periodic table in association with this system of weights and measures in conjunction with the grammar. He had to go back into the International Patent Office because this all has to be patented. So it disqualified all the old patents on planet Earth all the way back to the very, very beginning. So he had to resubstantiate all that. And all of that needs to be resubstantiated. Everybody's patent on all of their products now have to be resubstantiated in this quantum manner or under this quantum global construct and system. That way their, their patents can't be harvested, stolen by the old system any longer. They've all been saved. Everything has been saved. But he had to go around the planet and set this whole thing back up under his authority, all these locations. And what they ended up doing when the United Nations said, well, okay, but what land do you choose? They said, him and Dave said, they choose the land of the courts during the time of the contract. Why? Because that is where the courts, or all the contracts, are defended, is in the courts. Well, that's why Dave keeps talking about, we own the land of the courts, because their system just took down the old system, and the old system was enforced in the courts. Well, this system now rules the courts. So if you bring your old grammatical system in there and your old contracts into the courts, and they're not done properly, correctly, and truthfully, using the quantum grammar construct, they are disqualified and nullified as grammar fraud and bank fraud, all of it, across the board. Now, after coming back into the United States, after having run this gamut, he came back into the United States, and when he did, the Five Star Trust guys grabbed him up. Bush and the boys grabbed him up and literally beat the living shit out of this guy in an effort to get him to surrender that flag. These are the guys who have swept this all under the rug and have proceeded to move forward in their attempt to surrender the United States back over to the New World Order or to Great Britain, finish constructing their New World Order, go into the Middle East, steal the oil. They're heading back down to Venezuela to get Chavez out of there so they can get his banking system closed down. And once they have it all under wraps, they will then present the mark of the beast to everyone. However, Russell J. Gould did not surrender the flag, and he did not surrender his position. They took him into court, and they literally beat the hell out of this guy uh, on a couple of different occasions, and he won. And the Navy was behind him and supporting him all the way. We don't know what happened to that contingency. Uh, we can't speculate. We do have a couple of ideas. However, after 12 years of these guys not wanting to play ball and just do things correctly and move forward with this entire new global government system, Russell J. Gould, seeing that the Benjamin Franklin Post Office had now come out of bankruptcy and had come out of bankruptcy in 1999, right? But nobody remembered it. Nobody saw it. So what he did was when he came back into Washington, D.C. and filed the flag in there and, and legged in as the Postmaster General for the United States and the new, as the new Postmaster General of the world, he rewrote a new U.S. Constitution between his government and ours. And it's the same version of the one we had with Great Britain. Only this one doesn't have the one million laws attached to it that finally were created by the Congress and the Senate in relation to this system because we know there's always been two governments operating here, the King of Great Britain and ours. That's why you get the two-party system, right? The uh, Democratic and the Republic, or Republican. Um, so he rewrote the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It's still standing. The Declaration of Independence still standing. And because they didn't want to move forward with it and wanted to keep going forward with this New World Order surrender effort in on the year in the year 2012 and on the date December 21st 2012 end of the Mayan calendar he legs back in down here at the Philadelphia post office in Philadelphia Pennsylvania the Benjamin Franklin postal court or post office and reopen the entire US government back up for the people with a new US Constitution the same Bill of Rights Declaration of Independence, and it's all been quantized into this mathematical, grammatical fact. 
He saved the United States from surrender and takeover. He has saved the planet from a new world order effort to conquer us. He has saved the planet from a new world order effort under one man, a global dictator we all know as Lucifer, and has stopped them from being able to present the mark of the beast to all of us and attach us to this banking system as slaves. It's all been disqualified. It's all been shut down. It's over. The victory is ours. This is our lady of victory. This is our victory. It's just being kept from the people of the United States and the people of the world. And they're just not telling you the story in this manner because they don't want you to know about this system. And they said every time it pops up, they are going to ridicule the shit out of it in every manner possible. Because they said the American people are too stupid to believe, let alone understand any of this information. Now what he has done is he has purified the whore of Babylon and prepared her as the bride of Christ. And now he's got one foot in the sea, which is the uh, Admiralty and Maritime Jurisdiction, which is held which was held by the King of Great Britain up in Washington, D.C., and he has the civil jurisdiction law of the land, the terra firma foot, the, I'm sorry, the admiralty footing and the terra firma footing, and he's bridging the gap, rapturing you out of the land of the dead where you're once considered to be missing or presumed to be dead or lost at sea with your birth certificate system, ships you in through the Washington, D.C. postal location, out through the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania postal location, Civil jurisdiction law of the land where the blood testifies to the life and you are brought back into the land of the living and saved. Your soul is saved. Your country is saved. You are saved. This is Our Lady of Victory. Now you got to remember, the New World Order wasn't waiting for God to send down the seventh angel to fix everything. Right? These guys are waiting for Lucifer to stand up and give everyone the mark of the beast. So what happened after 1999? What you had happen there was a private corporation move into Washington, D.C. to run the government for the people of the United States. And it was under the command and control of George Bush Jr., who then declared war on the Middle East after they dropped the trade centers in New York. This was an orchestrated warfare plan by this group, the same group that started here. Okay, this was the same group of folks that initiated this, this bombing. If there were ever any weapons of mass destruction, they would have used the weapon of mass destruction to bomb the World Trade Centers. They wouldn't have flown a plane into it or into them. So these guys ultimately got what they wanted. They got tactical command and control of the militaries to go fight their wars so they could set up their one world global government. The next administration that moved in eight years later, once again, a private corporation. The first corporation was identifying itself with a three by five boat flag. It's not registered with the United Nations as the title four flag is or any other flags around the world are. They're much longer Okay, they're, they're coffin flags. They're long enough to cover a coffin. The 3x5 boat flag is not. It's a replica of the Title IV flag. Eight years after this guy was in office, a second administration moves in to run the country. And they've got a 25 by 25 size flag, Obama. This is a Ken and Barbie flag. It's not registered with any country in the world, anywhere. You could buy it at Toys R Us. And as a matter of fact, I don't even think they sell them there. So this corporation comes in and says, yes, we can. Yes, we can what? Force you to buy health care? That removes your freedom of choice. So now they've attacked your freedom of choice, your freedom of speech, your freedom of the press, and now they're coming after your guns, your Second Amendment. They're just chipping away at it. Everything you guys are seeing broadcast on the Tell A Vision is a psychological warfare effort. The Tell A Vision is still registered by the FCC as an entertainment device. Nothing coming out of it has to be real or even is real. That's why you hear Trump today saying it's all fake news. Everything you guys are seeing is what these guys are broadcasting 
that they want you to follow. That is their global narrative. Okay, the global narrative is there's a war on terror. You can't have a war on fear. Fear, terror, spookiness. Okay, you can't have a war where there's no known enemy. The folks over there in the Middle East are just trying to simply fight off a foreign invasion and kick us out of their country. These guys are just trying to go in, crush the banks. They got to steal the oil out of there using the Caspian Sea pipelines. That's the overall objective. And that is their global, that's the global narrative. Well, in psychological operations or psychological warfare, tactical command and control of the global narrative is what we strive for. However, this is the global narrative now. This is, this is our victory. This is our lady of victory, guys. It has defeated all of this across the board. We don't have to follow none of it. We've got to get these guys out of power here in the country. They don't have a flag. They don't have authorization. They don't have a charter that's been authorized correctly by the new Federal Postmaster General of the world. It's all been taken down, yet they still continue to move forward with their surrender back over to Great Britain or to the New World Order, this New World Order effort to create a one world global government with one person at the top. We all know it's Lucifer. They want your guns next. That is it. You're going to see it broadcast on the televisions. Anything they can, they can drum up, any story whatsoever in relation to guns or a gun killing or a murder or anything, they are going to whip any little thing they can into a national frenzy. This, again, is psychological warfare. They're taking anything they possibly can and spinning it into a national issue as though the whole nation is crying out, Oh, take our guns. We shouldn't have guns. That's what they want you to think is being cried out for here in this country when indeed it is not. It is being broadcast out of the televisions. It is a psychological warfare effort. And that is the last vestige. That's all they need here. And once you give that up, you will give up everything. Everything you've got. They will take it from you. You see the people of Great Britain? What do they have? Nothing. They have absolutely nothing. That is what you will have if they come and take your guns. You need to wisen up. It really all depends on whether people understand that the media that is giving them disinformation is owned by the Federal Reserve and this system, this system of control. And it's really up to humanity to realize that they're being hoodwinked, that when they turn on the news and they get the news from the mainstream media, they're just being fed propaganda. This is the very thing Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, and President Ronald Reagan warned the United States about. Do not surrender. Never surrender. Never surrender your, your beliefs Never surrender your, your morality. Never surrender your Christian beliefs and your faiths. Never surrender. We are a nation of peace. And this entire system was defeated through peace. Thank God. And thank God for the seventh angel for bringing it down. You know, there's a lot of people in our country who claim to be heroes. And there's a lot of men out there, women out there, that serve in the armed forces that are heroes. We, ne we never should have gone to war in the Middle East. It was whipped up by a New World Order crew. Well, now it's time for some real heroes to actually step up to the plate and defend this entire system. And that's what we're looking for. Where are you? Uh, they believe in perpetual imbalance. They want to have artificially created crises around the world that will further increase their wealth. They also believe in manufactured crises and permanent wars because wars are profitable. And the more that are fought, the wealthier they get. 
They want absolute control of education to, to program the public mind, to train those chosen for various roles, and to train others to be compliant. They want centralized control of education. They want us all uh, to be learning their propaganda. One size fits all. The size they determine, the size they want, the size that benefits them at the expense of everybody else. They want centralized control of foreign and domestic policies. They want the United Nations to become the world government. They want the United Nations taxes. They want the UN to act as, as a de facto world government imposing a UN tax on everybody in the world. They want uh, expanded uh, trading blocks such as NAFTA and the European Union to reduce the importance of individual countries and of individuals to have control over their destiny. They want global trade policies, one rules that they make that benefit them and again that harm everybody else. A global WTO, World Trade Organization, again, they make the rules, nobody else does. They want to expand NATO and other regional military forces, again, to weaken uh, the power of individual countries. They want NATO to be a global world enforcer. Challenge them, and NATO will ravage your country, murder your children, enslave you, destroy your country, to turn it to rubble. That's the role they want NATO to play. That's the perfect Bilderberg world. They make the rules. Everything goes the way they want. Anybody dissented, kill them. That's the Bilderberg world. Eric, can you be specific about when you met Rockefeller, how it happened in these discussions? I met Rockefeller through a female attorney I knew who called me up one day and said uh, one of the Rockefellers would like to meet you. I had made a video called Mad as Hell and uh, he'd seen the video and wanted to meet me and knew I was running for governor of Nevada. So sure, I'd love to meet him. And I met him and I liked him and uh, uh, he was a very, very smart man and uh, we used to talk and share ideas and thoughts. and. Um, He's the one who told me uh, 11 months before 9-11 ever happened that there was going to be an event. Never told me what the event was going to be, but there was going to be an event. And out of that event, uh, we were going to invade Afghanistan to run uh, pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We were going to invade Iraq, you know, to take over the oil fields, establish a base in the Middle East and make it all part of the New World Order and we'd go after Chavez in Venezuela. And uh, sure enough, later 9-11 happened, and I remember he was telling me how, <laughs> how you're gonna see soldiers looking in caves for people in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these places, and, it's, and there's gonna be this war on terror, uh, which is no real enemy, and the whole thing is a giant hoax, you know, but it's a way for the government to take over the American people. He told you it was going to be a hoax. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's no question. He says there's going to be war and terror, and he's just laughing. There's no. <laughs> Who are we fighting? 9/11 was done by people in our own government and our own banking system to perpetuate the fear of the American people and to subordinating themselves to anything the government wants them to do. That's what it's about, and to create this war, this endless war on terror. This was uh, eleven months before nine eleven. Yeah, and Nick Rockefeller, he's a lawyer. He is he he's become your friend over the previous years, and he's saying to you that there's going to be this big event, and then out of that we're going to have a war on terror, and it's just going to go on and on. Right, an endless war on terror without, without any real enemy. That you can never so you can never define a winner. And, and uh, did he say that it's going to be perfect because you can't define an enemy? It just goes yeah. on. Yeah, because you can't define a winner. There's no one who has no one to beat, so it goes on and on forever. And they can do whatever they want, and they scare the hell out of the American public. Look, this whole war on terror is a fraud. It's a farce. It's very difficult to say it out loud, because people are intimidated against saying it. Because if you say it, they want to make you into a nutcase. Uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, 
create a one world government run by the banking industry, run by the bankers. Where, and, and they're doing it in sections. The, the European currency, the euro, and, and the European constitution is one part of it. Now they're trying to do it in America with the North American Union, right? And they want to create a new currency called the Amero, right? And uh, the, whole, the, the whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an, R, R, an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is given me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, any time you have money in your, in, your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do, what everything, you sell. Everything is in there. And so they, they want a one world government controlled by them, everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips, and they control people. And you become a slave. You become a serf to these people. That's their goal. That's their intention. So, I mean, it really, it really almost makes you ask the question, would it have been better if we never invented the Internet? Now, this is exactly what we're doing. This is exactly what we're seeing. After the Twin Towers were dropped, we went right into Afghanistan. And this is an oil robbery, guys. This is There's no weapons of mass destruction over there. That's all bullshit. Full-blown bullshit. There were never any weapons of mass destruction over there. United States military was duped or being led by psychopaths. Idiots, morons, banksters, greedy bastards, and crazy people. Our military needs to be brought home, and we need to start working on the borders here and cleaning these senior offices out. That's what U.S. Special Forces was created for. That's why Kennedy created them, to liberate the oppressed. Well, that's us, guys. We're being oppressed by this entire system. And that's when he created you. He told you that there was a conspiracy so vast that it scared the shit out of him. And he created U.S. Special Forces to help clean it out. Okay, so that's your job up there, SF. It's not going around and doing the things you're doing, you know, guerrilla warfare tactics in other countries. You're supposed to be helping clean these banksters and these mobsters and these gangsters out of the United States, out of senior offices, and if necessary, go state to state to train the militias, the National Guard and the state militias. The people are to assemble, and that is their duty. The right to bear arms shall not be infringed. And that is because if the government ever becomes tyrannical, or the administration up there, the federal administration, which is a contract government, right, a contract system, if it ever becomes tyrannical and tries to invade and force its authority into the state's territories, it is to be stopped and replaced, if necessary, completely. Well, now we have the opportunity as a nation, thanks to David Wynn Miller and Russell J. Gould, who have established a brand new federal system, a global federal government system. They're the only guys in the history of the world to ever do this, pull this off, gentlemen. And it's high time we took a damn good look at it. Once again, and it's time that we bring these guys forward and start talking to them. Unfortunately, we can't bring Dave forward. It's a travesty. The gentleman has died. Um, but Russell J. Gould is still here. And he is who he is. And the American people need to be made aware of the situation. They need to be made aware of this quantum grammar construct and the magnitude and gravity, size and scope of what it is he set up. And it needs to be recognized by the military, by the rest of the, the NCO chain of command, so that the enlisted personnel understand it as well. This can't be held a secret anymore by, by the senior levels and kept hidden at the senior levels. This thing's got to come forward. 
It's our saving grace. This is what the people of the world have been screaming about. It's what they've been praying about. It's biblically, biblically prophesied to come forward, and it's here. Why are we keeping this a secret? Why are we not moving forward with this? I ask you, what the hell are we doing on planet Earth as a group of men? Right? Because I'm not a, I'm not a boat or a vessel. I sure the hell don't belong to somebody else, and I sure the hell am not someone else's piece of cargo that they're going to rape, plunder, and pillage and allow me to only make what I make just so I can barely scrape by. All right, that shit's over. We need to take a look at his banking system. It's a 10% flat tax, and that seriously needs to be brought forward as soon as possible. This Federal Reserve shit's out the door. Okay, they, they do nothing but but uh, work to enrich themselves. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that with the military up there in Washington, D.C., that Donald Trump and these guys are are planning to bring this whole system that, that uh, Miller and Gould set up forward. That's that's what we're hoping for. A bunch of us are hoping for it. Everybody's watching, okay? And uh, from what we understand, that is the plan. But if it is the plan, why have they not brought him forward into the public sector yet and introduced him and told everybody what's going on? Because Iran and Iraq and that is, is not that big of a deal. This is spun up horseshit, okay, over there in the Middle East. There's, there's nothing going on over there. This is all orchestrated, every bit of it. And it needs to come to a stop. Because these psychopaths aren't running this world anymore. It's over. And they know it. You know, they've been defeated across the board with this quantum system. And if we're not careful, they're going to steal it every bit of it, lock, stock, and barrel, and use it to put the screws back down on the people. When in actuality it was created to take the screws off the people, lift all the laws, it's all, it's a blank slate again, guys. Commander Gould rebuilt the U.S. Constitution. First things first, right? U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, it's all been quantized. It's there, but it just doesn't have the, the two million laws that these jackals up in up in DC, the Congress and the Senate, attached to it later to build the shit out of us, to harvest us as the harvest, right? I'll pay 10% to the church and I'll pay 10% in taxes. Flat tax on whatever I buy. But I'm not paying no income tax, no 10% income tax. And it's worse than that. It's at like one third. They're taxing us for one third of our income. A third of your income. That's a, that's a house payment every month for most people. Right? I paid for a house. Where's my house? The American people deserve better. It's out there. It's waiting. God brought it down. It's sitting. And it needs to be recognized by the people of the United States. I'm asking you guys. Do your due diligence. Research all of this. Watch their videos. Listen to them speak. They're going to tell you exactly what I've laid down here for you already. They set up an entirely new corporate federal government system, and it's global. And it took down all that it took down on the planet and replaced it all. It purified the whore of Babylon and prepared her as the bride of Christ. It's the exact same system we're using now. It's just been purified of all of the loopholes and all of the bullshit, right, that they've been using to enrich themselves. It works for them, but it doesn't work for me. right? Or they know how the loopholes work, so when I go in to try and get myself out of whatever debacle I'm in, I don't know the loopholes. It, it's, all, it's all foreign to me. They don't teach me this in school. They don't teach our children this at, at the grade school level and bring them up through high school and into college knowing this stuff so that they can conduct operations on their own in, in a manner here in the world that is best for not just themselves, but for the people they're working with and for, right? Man to man, person to person, spirit to spirit, soul to soul, right? And this, this grammar system does that. The contracts allow you to do that. The grammar allows you to do that. The entire government construct allows us to do that. And that's the beauty of this thing. So please, do your due do your due diligence, get involved, take a look at this thing again, and let's bring it forward. Let's get together as a group of military men on this planet, and let's bring it forward, and let's push.
Thank you. Well, the very first thing I would say is go out and buy silver and gold coins because we still have Federal Reserve notes and those pieces of paper um, are toilet paper. That is the very first thing that you should do because you do not want your family not to have currency and what you currently have is not worth anything. That's why the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are no longer paying for their international trade in dollars. Governments are no longer holding the Federal Reserve notes. We need to be very, un we, you need to do your homework as citizens and find out what it means when you have Federal Reserve notes. They are valueless and they are unconstitutional and we need to get that outfit out of here. That's the very first thing. And then the second thing is that we have to, um, we have to all um, work together to clean up the mess. And I don't think it's going to be that hard, actually, to, um, to get our republic back. 